Welcome back to our series on Asdarka pterosaurs. So far, we've looked at a few of the different giant species within this wonderful grouping and their research history, as well as examining just how these incredible reptiles were able to take off into the skies. Now, we're going to be looking at the various different lifestyles that have been proposed for these animals, and see which of these is most likely to be the correct way to view how the pterosaurs lived. Throughout the extensive research that has been done on these organisms, some very diverse and at times fairly ridiculous suggestions have been made for how they behaved. This is perhaps not too surprising given how totally bizarre as dark had seemed to us, with an overall anatomy not quite like anything alive today. So let's dive into some of these ideas. One of the earliest suggestions for the lifestyles of these pterosaurs was made in the actual announcement of the discovery of Quetzalcoatlus, possibly the most famous and the best known of all the Asdarkids. Published in 1975, the discovery of a giant flyer like this invited all sorts of questions into how such a remarkable creature would have fed, and the ecological niche it would have filled. Well, the first idea was that Quetzalcoatlus was specialised to be a scavenging animal, flying around over great distances on the lookout for large dead dinosaurs. It was thought that the long neck and beak of the pterosaur would have enabled it to probe deep inside the carcasses of big animals, therefore living in a similar manner to our modern day vultures. The evidence for this sort of behaviour was explained to be the fact that the location where the first fossils of Quetzalcoatlus were found was a non-marine deposit far away from any large lake deposits, and the only streams nearby were very small. Additionally, the fossil remains of sauropod dinosaurs were known from nearby areas, and therefore it was deduced that these animals could not have been piscivorous. Instead, they must have been adapted to feeding on carrion. The long neck was also, as I mentioned before, thought to be a specialisation for this. However, this isn't the best evidence for such a lifestyle. Just because the pterosaurs found in association with big dinosaurs doesn't really prove that they were scavenging on them. Indeed, the scavenging hypothesis has been mostly abandoned by pterosaur researchers, with it being argued that the beak was just not strong enough to be able to dig deep into carcasses and pull out bits of flesh. Unlike scavenging birds today, which have reinforced bone around the openings of the rostrum, as darkid skulls had relatively very thin bones surrounding these areas. Also, it's been suggested that the bony crest on top of Quetzalcoatlus's head would have impeded its ability to probe into carcasses, and additionally, the very stiff necks of these animals would make this behaviour difficult to perform. So, being specialised obligate scavengers doesn't seem to have a great deal of good support from the anatomy of these pterosaurs. Of course, this isn't to say these animals would not have scavenged the occasional carcass if they had the opportunity, but they were certainly not specialised for this and therefore would not have been doing it all the time. So this brings us to another lifestyle that was later proposed. Instead of being scavengers, it was suggested by other paleontologists that Quetzalcoatlus actually fed on invertebrates that burrowed into the soils or sands of the time, utilising their long and pointed beaks to poke into the substrate as they searched around. The main evidence for this behaviour though is again just that Quetzalcoatlus fossils had been found nearby to other organisms, but this time they were traces of invertebrate burrows. Current bird species that perform this behaviour do so through the use of organs that detect pressure gradients and vibrations produced by their burrowing prey, in addition to the sense of touch. However, there is no evidence in Asdarkid skulls, such as sensory pits, that these prehistoric animals possessed the sorts of organs used for detecting prey items submerged in sediment. Other morphologies of the skull also don't really display the same features of mud probing birds that would make them specialised for this feeding method, and the stiff, elongated neck would again result in the pterosaurs having a difficult time performing the actions necessary to probe the substrate. Since its first suggestion, the mud probing hypothesis has been quite significantly argued against by other researchers studying pterosaurs, and even mocked in some cases, leading to this idea too being mostly abandoned. Instead, many of the paleontologists who rejected the mud probing lifestyle favoured a very different feeding technique which, for a while, became the generally most widely accepted and popular idea of how as darkids lived. This hypothesis proposes that these pterosaurs were skim feeding animals, and would fly very close to the surface of a body of water, using their stiff necks to dip their lower jaws down until they came across a prey item in the water, at which point they quickly snapped their jaws shut and raised their beaks above the surface. Evidence for this sort of behaviour was first cited as that this feeding strategy had been suggested in other pterosaur groupings, and so therefore it was plausible that as darkids skim fed too. Not the most airtight argument, but later on other pterosaur researchers added some morphological evidence, stating that the rostrum of Quetzalcoatlus was compressed from side to side, and that these animals were not at all suited for walking about on the ground, therefore they were adapted for feeding while flying above the water. Additionally, the skull being streamlined and the elongated stiff neck was considered as support for this hypothesis, 
Unfortunately, some of these descriptions of morphology are not entirely correct, and there's actually quite a bit of evidence that's been argued by other paleontologists as going against the implied skin feeder lifestyle. For example, as darkered skulls are not actually particularly streamlined or even compressed from side to side in the way that modern skimmers are, the jaw joint and back of the skull were not well suited to enduring sudden impacts, and the jaws would not have been capable of shutting very quickly. This brings us to one of the most recent ideas for how as darkets lived. But before we get to that, let's quickly look at a couple of other proposals that are probably not as likely to be the true way these animals behaved. One of these ideas suggests that as darkets were actually swimmers, landing on the water's surface and diving down to catch aquatic prey, similar to various different modern bird species, as well as to what has been suggested for other pterosaur groups. However, the body plans of Asdarka pterosaurs would seem to inhibit this possibility, seeing as there are no adaptations of the limbs for a swimming action, the feet are relatively very small and so would not have been useful in underwater propulsion, and their broad wings, large heads and positioning of the skulls at the end of their long necks doesn't appear to result in a particularly streamlined anatomy for effective movement through water. Additionally, any sort of specialisation for sitting on top of the water can be ruled out as researchers have recognised that when birds float on the water's surface, they will tend to hold their heads near or directly above the centre of buoyancy. However, as darkets would have been incapable of orienting their stiff necks and large heads into high-angled positions, meaning they'd be very unstable if they were to land on water. Another suggestion that hasn't really had much support from pterosaur researchers is the idea of as darkets being mid-air predators that caught and fed on smaller flying animals. This doesn't fit well with the morphology of these animals for a few reasons, especially since aerial predators would have to be very agile while flying, which giant as darkids certainly were not. As well as this, these reptiles would have been forced to capture prey mid-air using their jaws, not their limbs, since this would destabilise them and result in the wing being stalled. However, the jaws of these animals are nothing like what we would expect for an aerial predator, making this another very improbable mode of life for these pterosaurs. So, this brings us finally to what currently appears to be the most likely way as darkets lived, which has been mostly accepted by a lot of pterosaur researchers in more recent years. This is the hypothesis that as darkets were stork-like in their lifestyle, being generalists that opportunistically fed on animals they came across on land or in shallow water. In other words, they were giant prehistoric death storks. There's a lot of good support for this idea, with the morphology of the animals actually in agreement with such a way of life. For example, the pterosaurs were clearly very well suited to walking about on the ground, as can be determined from the foot anatomy and the length of their legs, which would be necessary for a stork-like feeding method. The stiff, elongated neck and large skull, which has presented issues in the other proposed hypotheses, actually makes sense in the context of terrestrial foraging, since it means only a limited amount of vertical movement in the neck and skull is needed, with a small flexion of the neck easily bringing the lower jaw down towards the ground, allowing food items to be picked up. The skulls of as darker pterosaurs have also been described as resembling those of living birds that behave in this way, stalking about terrestrial environments. Examples of ground hornbills, marabou storks, as well as jabiru storks have been given, with long but fairly deep beaks similar to those seen in the pterosaurs, though the generalised Ciconia stork genus is cited as the best modern analogue to these creatures. This generalist morphology means that the Asdarkids could have been feeding on a wide variety of different food types which would be crucial if they were wandering around on the lookout for anything they could eat. Significantly, the generalisation of the skull also means that they lacked any of the specialisations that would be needed for the lifestyles of skimming, scavenging, mud probing or aerial predation. Although, certain as darkered species do seem to have specialised into variations of the terrestrial stalker mode of life. For example, Hatsigopteryx being particularly robust, and with a relatively shorter neck, becoming the top predator of its ecosystem and Alanqua, which potentially had a jaw suited to crushing hard foods such as shellfish. And there may actually be some support from trace fossil evidence for this hypothesis too. There's a trackway known from late Cretaceous rocks in Mexico preserving what have been interpreted as as darked hind and forefeet traces, as well as some strange gouges. These gouges have been suggested by some to perhaps be scrapes caused by the beak of the animal that made the other imprints meaning that this might be direct fossil evidence that as darkids could indeed lower their jaws all the way to the ground. However, after this hypothesis was first proposed by paleontologists Darren Nash and Mark Witten back in 2008, it did receive some criticisms, specifically in a 2013 paper which argued that fossils of as darkids are very often found in aquatic deposits, so they must have been feeding there, 
that as dark heads being on the ground would have made them incredibly vulnerable to predators, and that a pelican-like feeding method is much more likely. But a response to this was soon published, defending the terrestrial stalker hypothesis as still the most probable interpretation we have of Asdarkid lifestyle. The first criticism, that Asdarkid fossils are found in aquatic deposits, is a pretty weak argument, given that fossils of terrestrial animals are often found in such deposits since this is one of the best places for fossilization to occur. Indeed, these pterosaurs have often been discovered in the same aquatic deposits where reptiles such as dinosaurs and birds are found, because this is just where they all end up after death. The next problem was the suggestion that as darkids would have been highly vulnerable to attack from predators if they were walking around on the ground a lot of the time, but this is also not the best argument, especially since such an assumption is pretty speculative. Modern bird species that practice the same sort of lifestyle don't seem to be constantly under attack from predatory animals, meaning it is possible to live in this way without being instantly torn to shreds. And although today's terrestrial stalkers are not living at the same time as huge theropods, these animals are not likely to have been a constant threat to giant pterosaurs, probably preferring to go after much easier to catch prey, like modern predators do. As we saw in the last episode, large Asdarkids were quite proficient at quickly taking off using the quad launch method, and therefore would also have been able to avoid potential dangers if they needed to. It's also worth acknowledging that a giraffe-sized creature with a massive sharp beak on its face would have been a pretty terrifying thing to see, and making one angry could end quite badly for the aggressor. Finally, the alternate suggestion of a pelican-like feeding strategy is also not really more likely than the terrestrial stalker idea. This proposes that the pterosaurs flew close above the water's surface, like with the skim feeding hypothesis, and then opened their jaws when they saw prey, expanding out a throat sac to swallow the organisms. But, as Witten and Nash explain, there are many issues with this idea. As darkid jaws lack all of the very unique specialisations present in pelican jaws that allow them to feed in the way they do, and the bit of anatomy in Asdarkid's skulls cited as the main evidence for such a feeding technique, a helical jaw joint which supposedly allowed the lower jaws to bow out and expand the volume of the mouth like a pelican's, is actually present across many different members of the archosaur lineage in animals that feed in a wide variety of different ways, meaning it's not likely this feature has much significance in how an organism feeds. Once again, it was found that the morphological evidence best suits a terrestrial stalker mode of life for Asdarkids, and this now seems to be the most accepted Asdarkid lifestyle, though keep in mind that new discoveries could always change our perceptions of these animals, but for the moment, this is the most probable hypothesis we have. The whole journey of scientific discovery seen in the history of Asdarkid research is a really fascinating example of how science can work, despite the several instances of not exactly great science going on, with assumptions about lifestyles being made from a few selective examples of anatomy. Nevertheless, after a while a more evidence-led, objective overview of the whole anatomy came along that presented a logical interpretation of how these ancient organisms could have lived. And what an incredible group of animals for this to all be focused on. New discoveries about Asdarkids continue to be made, and hopefully we'll see many more developments in our understanding about these creatures in the future. I really hope you all enjoyed this series on the Asdarkids, and I'm sure we'll end up revisiting these utterly amazing organisms again in more videos. They're just too cool to leave alone. Before we end this video, I'd like to again recommend checking out the sources I've used, particularly Mark Witten's brilliant blog posts, and his great book on pterosaurs, which should be a standard for anyone interested in these animals, or even paleontology and evolution in general. And thank you to everyone who has sent in their wonderful artwork, it always amazes me to see the incredible artistic talent people have. We've had a lot of art sent to us, so I apologise if you're not featured yet, but we're going to keep this going every week so we can hopefully feature as many people as possible. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.